So thank you very much for your time. And we are now connecting to Boston. Hello, Ted. And um, the first question is easy because I would like to ask you to uh, shortly introduce yourself. Um, what is your name um, and uh, what are you doing um, regarding all the improvisation? Welcome everyone. Hi, my name is uh, Theodore Klein. I basically go by Ted. I um, currently am managing partner of a firm called Boston Strategy Group, a consulting firm in Boston. Um, I have uh, previously, my career has been, as you can tell, I'm quite old. My career has been in management consulting for all of my life. I spent many years at IBM running some of their consulting work. I was a senior executive at Accenture. Um, and prior to that, I was the CEO of a consulting firm in the Boston area that was once named one of the 100 leading consulting firms in the United States. Uh, by way of background, I've also been an assistant professor at Boston University, and I've also taught at Boston College. I spent a year living in Germany, teaching in Germany, graduate students, MBAs. Uh, and my background has predominantly been in organizational behavior, working with large organizations to essentially how do we make an organization function or perform better, improve their effectiveness. Well, that sounds a, um, a very interesting uh, scientific and business career. Um, so what is the connection to improvisation uh, in your company? Well, the connection with improvisation is I am very new to improvisation. I only learned about it about three or four years ago. I have always had a bit of a silly side. I've always had a kind of a quirky sense of humor. You may notice in back in my office, there are some hats that are hanging that I have worn at various times over my career. In any event, I retired from IBM about eight years ago, and I did the normal things that older people do, and I was getting quite bored. I was curious about getting involved in stand-up comedy because of my silly, quirky side, and I found a place in the Boston area that taught improv, and I said, okay, let's give that a shot, and it was really quite out of the box. It was just sort of like I was very curious to learn about improv and to see if I would like it. Well, I took this very first introductory class in improv. I think I was 62 or 63 years old. I was a fish out of water. Everybody in the class was in their 20s. Many of them looked around and said, what is grandpa doing here? And I, from the very first class, fell in love with it. It was everything that I had been doing throughout my career. And that is basically active listening, uh, trying to be creative, trying to be collaborative. And I was actually a little bit shocked. I was quite annoyed. And I was annoyed because I had known nothing about improv for the first 60 years of my life. And I, if I had known about it, I would have used it in my consulting in the 35 years that I had been doing consulting. I saw it as being incredibly impactful, incredibly uh, powerful to helping people understand how to collaborate, how to communicate, how to innovate, how to lead. And I continued taking classes in, in improv and have now can finished probably about 12 or so classes in improv. I am strictly an amateur, no aspiration to become a professional performer, but I see a great impact into organizations. And um, that's how I got started, at least in the field. From a company point of view, I am a bit of an entrepreneur. I have started companies before. I've advised people on how to start companies. I like creating companies. And about two years ago, I was sitting with a bunch of colleagues over drinks. They asked me what I was doing. I told them I was taking improv. And the gentlemen I was sitting with were older people in their 60s, senior executives at some major companies, also in the HR function. One of them was an executive vice president of HR at a very big Boston bank. And when I told them I was taking improv, my colleagues started laughing. They thought it was funny. They started making a great deal of fun of me. They asked me whether or not I was having a midlife crisis, whether I was going to buy a fast sports car, because they thought improv was silly. But I began to tell them about all the academic work that's being done, stuff that's being published, stuff that Lucas is working on and his people are working on. I talked about the scientific side of improv. I talked about the articles in the Harvard Business Review and in many of the major business 
magazines, Forbes, Harvard Business Review, Wired, Fortune, um, are all writing articles about improv. And by the end of the evening, my colleagues and I had had way too much to drink. We decided we'd start a consulting company. So that's how Boston Strategy Group got started. And the mission of the company is to bring applied improvisational techniques into corporate America and into universities. And as I was telling Lucas earlier, when we first got on that I'm quite pleased because I received a call this morning, a telephone call from a uh, university we submitted a proposal to and they accepted it. It's our first client. We've been in business a year now working very hard and we now have landed today our first client. So that's kind of my background and a bit on this company. So congratulations, uh, not only to the first client, but to this wonderful story. Uh, I had to giggle all the time because it's so, so great. I, I love the story because typically, like, you know, like it is 20 year old, they start some, some improv workshops and then they think, oh, they, they try to do some entrepreneurial stuff, uh, but they will not succeed and so on. But you start with on a totally different level, um, you know, you know, after a success, successful career, then you experience that and, 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 and you have the courage to start it. So this is what I found wonderful. And I haven't found any company yet worldwide doing that, you know, like trying to understand the scientific and, and the, the business parts on applied improvisation and to really um, try to, to, to build a company. So having said that, uh, can you tell us more about the company? So, so what is it or what is, uh, what is your aspiration uh, in that? Yep, the company, Boston Strategy, right now, we have about 15 people working for us. We're all working on a remote basis. Uh, all of us are working in a part-time capacity. Uh, what, now that we've gotten our first client, things will probably begin to ramp up because we are writing other proposals for other organizations as we speak. But our aspirations right now are to be regional, but to basically take a very, very professional consulting approach where we would leverage applied improvisational techniques to help organizations communicate, collaborate, lead, innovate, uh, build better teams, using applied improvisational activities to increase that kind of a capacity in any organization. We are regional, we're focused in the higher education markets, we're focused in financial services, these would be our clients, universities, banks, insurance companies, investment firms. We're also focused in the life sciences market, uh, pharmaceutical firms, biotech firms, medical device firms. We're also focused in information technology clients, software clients, hardware clients, networking clients, and any, if you are familiar with the New England economic geography, uh, those are the industries that predominate in New England. New England is a hotbed of higher education. There are many, many, many life sciences and pharmaceutical companies. There are many information technology companies. And that's why we've chosen those markets very carefully because of those are the ones that predominate in New England. Um, we want to be close to our clients. We don't want to have to get on airplanes and go around the world. Quite frankly, I spent my life working in Europe, working in United Kingdom, uh, Australia, South America. I think I've been on every continent except Antarctica. And frankly, I don't want to do that anymore at my age. So we consciously said, we're going to stick to New England. There are a lot of very large, prosperous companies. We will focus there and we will develop applied improvisation programs for them. So as far as I understand, um, you, you, you sell the, the, the service of um, understanding and learning and, and training the, the improvisational skills and mindset. As far as I know, you have some, some slides uh, also prepared to give sure. an overview if you want to share them. Sure. What, one of the things for people who may have some background in economics or economic history, or obviously business, applied improv we've learned from our research is very early on in what's known as the product life cycle, the logistics or the S-curve. So we believe there's gonna be significant growth over the next five to 12 years in that market or in this industry. Another piece is uh, improv right now, applied improvisation is what is often called economically a guild environment. It harkens back to the middle ages when everybody had a 
um, a profession or a trade. You had goldsmiths, you had tinsmiths, you had barrel makers, and people apprenticed themselves to these various practitioners and learned a trade. Uh, there were not large corporations at that time in the 16 or 1700s. Um, today, applied improvisation is very much a guild. You have many individual practitioners out there that are doing workshops. Uh, they often will hire their friends or apprentice their colleagues to work with them. But the corporate model in applied improv is still at the very, very early stages. There are a couple of companies around the world that do do it from a professional consulting point of view, but I would say 95% of the market right now are individual practitioners. We are not an individual practitioner. We are building a corporation, a company of talented professionals who would be organized using a consulting model to deliver our services. Uh, Second City in New York is it, excuse me, Second City in Chicago is an example of this. They have a corporate model to deliver applied improv. There are a few companies in New York City that have a corporate model. And I believe, but I'm not totally sure, I think there's somebody in Berlin that has a corporate model and there may be somebody in London as well, but they are few and far between. We are definitely taking a highly professional consulting approach towards improv. And the basic idea is if you're gonna be selling applied improvisation, it's considered by many senior executives to be just team building or silly at best. It's an amusing thing. We are basically taking the approach of professionalizing it, institutionalizing it, uh, and basically we are telling people we are not trying to have fun. We are trying to improve your organization. We may have fun doing it, but that's not the goal. We are not trying to build teams. We're not doing team building. You can take your organization out for games, for dinner parties, for paintball, and you can have a lot of fun. That's not what we're doing. We have scientific ways of how to improve your organization using applied improv. So um, based on that, one of the very first things that we did last year was to take a scientific or academic approach to applied improv. And we put together what we consider an academic framework, a pretty good one whereby I can go in or my people can go in, talk to the CEO of a very large organization and explain to them how improv will improve their organization. We're trying to create a solid value proposition. What is the value to the organization and trying to quantify the economic benefits. There's a trick in the consulting industry. It may not be best called a trick, but there's a technique and in consulting, the idea is when somebody is less than convinced of the value of what you're offering and you are a consultant, the way to convince a client is to take on an extremely small engagement and wow them or uh, do such a great job that they immediately see what they're doing. That's basically a technique that we're using as well. We're going in with educational programs that are small and very focused and clearly showing what the benefits are. So metrics, quantitative analysis, analysis of benefits, demonstration of improvement are all built in to our programs. It's not just, oh, we'll get up in front of a group, we'll run a bunch of fun activities and everybody will walk away happy. We're taking a very systematic, methodical and rigorous approach to this. So what I'll do is if I can, I'll share my screen. I'll just sort of begin to give you guys a quick overview of our framework. And this is an academic framework. It's not something that we would share with a client, but it's a way, a way for us to convey our ideas to clients in a consistent way and in a way that actually shows value. So um, if I can, uh, let's see if I can pull this up. And I'll, by the way, I was gonna say, if anyone wishes, I'd be happy to um, share these slides. I, Lucas, I believe has a copy of them. How's that, Lucas? Is that coming up? Yes, clearly? we can see it clearly and in full screen. Okay. So you can see this is simply a conceptual model. So this is from an academic perspective. And I'll skip through it, but it basically consists of three things. It consists of a definition of applied improvisation that is easily conveyable to a corporate executive, the model itself, and then showing how the model fits all together. And I'll probably go through this very fast, 
Uh, there is, having been a professor before, I used to often start my classes by telling students that there was a famous professor from Germany or maybe even Austria many, many years ago that said to his class, I am about to teach you something and I'm going to speak. While I speak, you are going to listen. If you happen to finish listening before I finish speaking, please raise your hand. So I will go through this as quickly as I can, uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions afterwards if by haps you chance to finish listening before I finish speaking. One of these slides just shows that applied improvisation is nothing more than another educational technique. It is no better, it is no worse, it is applicable in some situations, it is not applicable in others. But this simply shows where applied improvisation fits on many, many, many other educational techniques. And the axes are simply, where is the learning conducted? Is it conducted in the real world or is it conducted in a classroom? And the other axis is to what extent is the learning abstract or to what extent is the learning experiential? So very quickly, if you look at the bottom left, reading is something that can be done in a classroom or by oneself and it's abstract. Top right of the matrix shows that if you have an internship that often takes place in the real world and it's highly practical. So this is not to say that implied improvisation is the best, the most important, or the greatest learning technique. It is part of a portfolio of learning techniques, but it is a learning technique that has only recently come into people's view as something that is highly relevant and highly practical. So we're trying to level the playing field here as we get started. The next slide, and I would say this is probably one of the most, if not the most important slide in this entire presentation, is that we very quickly learned that applied improvisation is different from improvisation. And we defined, and this is our own definition, we can have a discussion about it later. There is improv as a product. Improv as a product is what we normally would think of as theatrical improvisation. The goal there is a staged performance to amuse, to entertain, to enlighten some audience. And we use a variety of games and techniques and things that we learn in theatrical improv to conduct that performance. That's not what we as a company or what we are doing. Now, by the way, I am an improv performer personally, but that's, I'm an amateur improv performer and I enjoy it, but that's not what we're doing here. We're talking about not product improv, where the output is a product, but process improv. This is where we use many of the same games, ideas, exercises, but we use them to examine interpersonal capability to help people become better at collaboration, to be better at team building, to be better communicators, to be better leaders, to be better at recognizing the emotions in an environment so that they can perform better in an organization. So you can see there is some overlap. We have examined a little of this overlap, but they are two entirely separate from our point of view perspectives. And we are focused on the orange slide on the right-hand side. The process is designed to improve a personal or organizational capability. I probably more precisely would say an individual or organizational capability. So we're gonna be focusing on the right-hand side here. I'll skip these through here. Uh, this is a slide I will only point on the definition. It is a definition that I very much like, which is in bold. Applied improvisation is only a training and facilitation modal modality. It's a technique. It uses the theater techniques and applies them to help people or organizations adapt and move without a script and be effective in ambiguous situations. So that's the requisite academic definition that every professor throws up on the blackboard on the very first class, kind of saying that's what we're doing. So now we get into the model that we created. And the model basically uh, looks like this. This is a common business model. I'll try not to bore you with the details, but it consists of four levels, values, principles, guidelines, and ideals. And they go from the ambiguous to the specific. 
And there are various ways of analyzing this model from a business and psychological perspective. The, this is the levels of the model. Ideals are aspirations, things that we're trying to get towards. Guidelines are things that we're trying to follow, but we don't have to follow. Operating principles are things that we're supposed to follow. they are rules that we're not supposed to break. And values are things that we start with or that we hold dear. They are what focus what we're going on. They are what create where we're headed. Without reading through all the words, and I can send you all of this later, um, those are the four levels of the model. So from an improv perspective, if those of you who have studied improv, these are the fundamental values that drive improvisation. Uh, active listening, saying yes, and saying and. That's what's important. That's what every improvisational person is generally taught the very first day. That's what you have to do. You have to listen. You have to say yes. You can't say no. And you have to say and. Now, as you get more proficient in improv, you begin to understand under what circumstances these rules might apply and might not, but they are fundamental values. So we could talk, and I won't at the moment talk about why are they fundamental values, but those are the three fundamental values. This is simply a definition of what those values are. And again, I won't read through them. I'm sure many of you are already intimately familiar with them. What we then did was to say, okay, we have these two sides of improv, the performative improv, product improv, or process improv. How do we improve an organization? And we began to define these three values on both sides. So we now can explain those values from a theatrical sense or from an organizational sense. And we did that to show the linkages and the connections between the two. We then get to the next level, which is called principles. And we identified what are known as the nine key principles of improv. And they are listed there and they're probably familiar to there. Some of those words should look familiar. And what we basically said, there are nine principles built on the three values. And they loosely correlate to the three values. So you can see those nine boxes built on the triangle correlated to the values. Principles, as you can see on the slide from the left, set, they turn the value that you hold into a practice that shape your behavior and action. So a principle is nothing like, one of my personal principles is I'm gonna be honest. It guides how I behave, it guides how I act. Different people hold different pr personal principles. In improv, we've identified nine that you are supposed to adhere to. And we define them. All of these principles have now been defined. Then we did the exact same thing I talked about a moment ago. We can explain the principles from a performative point of view and from an organizational or management point of view. Once again, we're connecting theatrical improv with business. What you might be able to imagine is an executive who I'm talking to and trying to convince of the validity of this is looking at this and going, oh, this stuff is exactly I'm trying to do. For example, a good manager or leader is in a constant state of awareness. They are aware of their physical environment, the moods, behavior, and actions of the people in their vicinity and of the consequences of the actions that they take. Any CEO will read that paragraph and go, oh yeah, I have to do that. I have to operate under that principle. Well, I can now say that's a common principle in improv as well. Let me show you how they connect. So I can now begin to connect all of the nine improv principles with management. And a good CEO will look at it and go, you know, I've been improvising throughout my career. And my response will be, absolutely. Now, how about we teach your people how to do this as well? And how do we teach them how to improvise better? And most CEOs with that argument will go, yep, I'll have you guys come in and see if you can do anything. And that's how we sell our consulting services. So again, all the principles are connected between theatrical improv and management. We then get to guidelines. If you recall that triangle I put up before, 
the base was values, principles were on laid on values, and now guidelines are laid on principles. If you've taken an improv class, you will easily see many of these and have heard of many of these. These are the 22 guidelines and they are just our ideas. I'm not trying to say that they are the only guidelines. They're the ones that we have chosen to focus on after much discussion and argument amongst ourselves. And we've begun to connect these guidelines with the values and with the principles. So there you see the, well, you actually can't see because it's way too small on the slide. And I know that, but you can see how the guidelines turn the principles into methods that are then used in a certain way that I'll explain in a moment. So the guidelines connect down to the principles, which connect down to the values. And there are the 22 principles expanded in size so you can actually read them. So as you read from left to right, that was what was in the slide before, simply showing what are the principles by which you operate, excuse me, showing the guidelines by which you operate that are based on the principles. Here is, again, there are 22 of them, an explanation of each of these improv principles. And this, by the way, was done by reading about 15 different improv books and consolidating them. So this is all based on a lot of improv research and work that's been done. Again, same process. We looked at the principle, we defined it in terms of theatrical improv, and we defined it in terms of management. Pay attention is a key guideline that you're taught in improv. From a management point of view, an effective manager is not easily distracted, pays careful and constant attention to the key factors impacting the achievement of their objectives. Any management class you take will have that sentence in it and say a manager has to pay attention to their environment, their competition, their employees, and a whole other various segments. So I'll again make the point that a CEO or a senior executive will read these things and go, yeah, I do that. I didn't realize it was all part of an improv curriculum. And some of them may look at some of these and say, you know, I need to get better at that. I need to get better at, take, at accepting gifts. I need to take, get better at looking for patterns. And we can begin to talk about how we can do that. So we're back to the model here. You can see the values, the principles, the guidelines, and the core ideals. Core ideals are what you are aspiring towards. Now here, we are not aspiring towards having fun or to amusement. Remember, that's product improv, not process improv. But in every organization, what you're aspiring towards is often a goal, an objective. You're often trying to aspire to serve a greater whole, the community, your country, the environment. Your goal is to provide support to your colleagues. Your goal is to be able to trust people, those that you can trust. There's a full recognition that there are many people you can't trust, but the going in ideal is let's trust somebody until they show they're not worthy of that trust and let's have some fun. We are human. We're on this planet, not only to make money, raise families, have a successful career, but part of life in my personal philosophy is let's have a little bit of fun while we're doing it. And I think most people would embrace that. So that's the model. That's the fundamental academic model that we use to convince people that this is not just to have fun. This can actually improve organizations when it's done properly. So this again, the definition of the ideals, a comparison of the ideals from a theatrical versus an organizational point of view. The ideals showing how trust creates playfulness, creates support, helps serve a larger population, which will help you achieve an organizational goal. Whether that organizational goal is market share, whether that organizational goal is community environment, excuse me, community involvement, whether that organizational goal might be nonprofit and environmentally related. All of these goals connect. And then lastly, we can put it together in this tree diagram, which basically shows how all these pieces fit together. And by doing, by explaining it this way to executives, we achieve our goal, which is beginning to show the value of improv in an organizational setting. 
There are other materials that we have that show the quantitative benefits. There are others that show how we propose. I have materials that can tell you about the history and how our company works and is organized. But I think I probably said way too much at this point. So I'll stop, turn it back to Lucas and be happy to answer any questions. Wow, now that was a great journey and you answered all the questions I would have had or I didn't have yet. So thank you very much for this wonderful journey. And I, I, I yeah, I even um, hear the applause or seen from some participants <laughs> doing that. So thank you very much for this uh, wonderful uh, pitch or even a kind of TED talk. Oh, TED talk, how great is that? <laughs> so thank you very much for this one.